Oh, we're back for another barbershop talk. Welcome back, folks. We've been rocking with barbershop talk from I don't know three, two, one. I don't know a couple years ago. Uh, my name is Warren Clark. I am very honored and privileged to be part of this project and uh, seeing it manifest where it is now. So thank you very much for registering for this. And uh, we have two special guests here, which we're going to introduce in a moment. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I am on, oh, oh, I'm talking about down to Ottawa, uh, Algonquin Territory, which I'm not, but because um, I'm so given that the uh, Ottawa, uh, Ottawa Territory, so I'm going to actually help have maybe one of you tell me with that in terms of uh, the, the seated line we, we situate ourselves respectfully. Um, but before we get into things, I um, also want to acknowledge people in Winnipeg. Thank you very much for taking a chance on this uh, special uh, edition of Barbershop Talk, Black Men Misconceptions. Uh, this is an opportunity for us not to only talk about how we as a community uh, cannot acknowledge um, the social, economic, and political uh, you know, concerns about, among black young men, uh, but how we can work together and, and solve some of these concerns, right? Um, and one of the best part about being in a barber shop is that a lot of vulnerabilities of black men happen here, right? Meaning that there's a lot of things that are said between the barber and many black young men, or just men in general. Um, so, for instance, you know, like, who's your favorite basketball player? I don't know. Anybody? A favorite basketball player? He, he, he's, he's not playing anymore. He's, he's not retired. Playing anymore. He's retired. But see, like, then that can turn into a debate, right? So the whole purpose of the barbershop talk and the format we use it for is to have these types of conversations, not only about sports, but things that can help us understand how we can support young black men who's growing up. You know, because I'm not young anymore, although I wear Jordans and whatnot. But needless to say, um... So do we have, I think we have a video on Barbershop Talk we're playing. Are we doing that? I think we're doing that? Let's cut to that video. And then we'll come back with our guests. So ACMP is a mentorship program that's focused on supporting the success and development of Afro-Caribbean uh, and Black students. And uh, we realize that these students face a unique set of challenges during their education and their time at university. And so ACMP tries to help these students by positioning them to overcome those challenges. Well, I consider myself youth, I guess. I'm 19. So um, I think I love hearing this question on how we can, you know, make the youth want to go to post-secondary. That's something I'm very passionate about. And as Warren just mentioned, um, I'm so beyond grateful I got the chance at Carleton to learn about the um, ACMP because I believe in mentorship. I think it's so important for youth to see themselves in this position and have someone to kind of guide them, especially when there's in predominantly white institutions. You know, it doesn't have to come in the form of the N-word. You know, we see this a lot in our institutions, high schools, universities. We see this a lot when we, 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 we come to know that our black students are being, majority of them are being streamlined to applied courses and not academic courses, which derails their moments or their opportunity to get into post-secondary education. That in itself is anti-black or connects to anti-black racism. It also connects to a, a creating a barrier to education. It also connects to the stripping of your right to, to knowledge. Extrovert. I want students to feel like, to feel comfortable. You know, we don't want, we, we're a community and that's like the power of the community, right? Is feeling comfort and feeling supported and not feel alienated. So, 
that's like one thing I want students to know is you're not alone, you're supported and you got this. And it's just like, just all love, all support all around. Thank you. So more information about the Afro-Caribbean Metro program, please check out weareacmp.com and it's associated with this programs and workshop talk about documentary misconceptions. So tonight's theme is the normalization of the myth of the um, the absent black father. You know, there's been a couple of movies come out that come to mind when I think about how how this is a myth. Uh, one, the, the upcoming film with Will Smith uh, called King Richard. Uh, which is a story about Serena uh, Williams and Venus Williams' uh, father, um, which is a good portrayal of how that is a myth. Um, and the other one, the Kevin Hart one, I didn't get to last night tomorrow. I didn't get to, which we're going to do in a moment because we were doing this morning, right? So, uh, which is another, um, you know, visual of how, you know, this, this normalization is actually, of the absent black father is, is not true in many ways in different forms, which we're going to discuss today. So to today on my left is Dr. Simon Charles um, and Dr. Tamari Katosa. Um, who we're not, can, can we go with first names today? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Thank you. I think I think it's important, right? Like first names, Charles, not Dr. Oh, Charles. Charles. Sorry about that. <laughs> Dr. Uh, so Charles, Charles, we're doing Charles today. My my fault. My, my, not today. We're well, with Charles respectfully and Tamari. All right. And I think it's it's fitting, but I think it's important to get to know who they are a little bit. So, uh, just bring up my phone here. Uh, here we go. So, uh, Dr. Kutoso, or Tamari, uh, earned his BA and uh, um, his MA at York University uh, and his speech at the University of Toronto. Uh, he has his forthcoming book. Can we get a shot of the book real quick that I think is important people see it because, you know, seeing is believing, all right? Uh, really, uh, oh, God, I see it inside play football, right? Uh, appealing because he's appalling, all right? So please check this out. Uh, it's on black masculinity, colonialism, and erotic racism, uh, which is important for your knowledge exchange, important for just uh, uh, learning more about, um, from a Canadian perspective, that too, on black masculinities. Um, so please, please, please check it out. And also with uh, joining us is Charles, get the speaker and experience lecturer, Dr. Oh, sorry, Charles. Um, has developed the talent for putting social and political problems into critical perspective. Uh, an independent scholar, he is of Guyanese heritage, grew up in Bristol, England, and is now a Canadian citizen. So thank you very much for joining us. Can I put your book here? Can we do that for a bit? Sure. I think so. You know, it's, it's here. You know, you can get it. It's hot. All right. Um, also want to acknowledge, again, uh, we do have folks from Winnipeg, Winnipeg Masses. Thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, this conversation is not only going to be situated in, in with what's going on in the barber shop, um, but also people are home. Um, it's an opportunity for not only to listen during the conversation we're going to get to in a moment, um, but it's an opportunity for us to all learn, which is the most important thing of what this whole barbershop talk session really is all about. Um, after the hours, which we're going for an hour, or about an hour talk between the three of us here, uh, Charles, Tamara, and myself, uh, we're going to open up the space for people online and people here in the, in the, in the barbershop uh, to ask questions. And yes, people will be getting a haircut as we're doing this, right? So it's going to happen. So these things are happening. So without further ado, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, taking the opportunity and being here. Much appreciated. Um, and you came from far out, too. I want to acknowledge that, too, because you know, tomorrow you see from, uh, from Scarborough. So welcome back. Thank All right. You. Welcome back. So... Uh, let's get into things, shall we? Shall we? Mm -hmm. right, let's, we're doing this? We're doing this? All right. Okay, cool. We're getting pictures too. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we talk about this, you know, this normalization of, uh, of, of, of the myth of the black, uh, absent black father. You know, what are some, what are some thoughts that come to mind, you know, when that, when we, when you, when we were trying to start this conversation? Um, just, what would you like to take this conversation? Before we start, Warren, yeah. I care so much about you. I wanted to tell you, put your phone in a safe place. Oh, I don't right want to here. Fall. There we go. That's Thank scary. You. Appreciate it. Yeah. Go ahead, bro. Um, it's a topic that I've had with many men over the years. Yeah. And this is brother here, uh, number one, because I wouldn't be here were it not for Charles. Uh, 1987, fresh out of school in Scarborough, going to York University. There was a rally on the campus, and I heard this booming voice 
it was a pro-Palestinian uh, uh, rally oh, yeah. on the campus. <laughs> and this man put down one lecture that just left everyone mesmerized. And I'm like, I got to get to know who this guy is. Mm -hmm. And from that, right, he set me on a path of learning, right? Third world books helped to expand that out. And so the conversations that I had with Charles and other guys on the campus, that's what helped to bring me into manhood. Right, I would have really gotten lost were it not for the company of those men. So when I think about the myth of the uh, absent black father, I think about the ways that it's a, it's a stereotype that demonizes and that it moves us away from thinking about how black men mentor and other father and father each other and mentor each other's kids. And I think this is where we need to go because this is how we are doing it, and we have always done it. As I pointed out in that little piece on the, on the ACMP website, from the moment that we were in the slave ships on the plantations, we were always other father. There were always black men supporting and sustaining other men's families, partners. It's simply a part of life. When you think about the ways in which uh, mothering occurs, and particularly in the diaspora, where black women have a lot of control over their sexual reproduction. There's a lot of ways in which we as black men help to support our families and that's demonized by constructing us because as these absent fathers, because the nuclear family, that myth called the nuclear family, that concept really does not apply to many of us the way that we conceptualize and practice family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll say this. Wow, that's a, that's a real, that's a baseball back, back to the back of my head. I bring back so many memories, man. Um, but I'll say this, you know, at the time I met you at York, there were many others who were like you, right? And my feeling, I never, I, ne I one, one of the reasons I'm glad, I'm so grateful to you, is that what, uh, I, like, what you're talking about, I did, others did for me, right? And it was only like automatic that it was done for others. So I never thought of it as something exceptional. It was just what was done. Let me give you a brief bio. I grew up in Guyana, right? My mother and father left Guyana and went to England. In those days, the British government would advertise in the local papers, work is needed in England, right? If you were a young man and you didn't go, your grandmother, your grandfather, your big brother, your neighborhood, whatever, would take you to to the British consulate to get your papers and get your ass on a boat to England, right? Yeah. So when that happened, we were raised, I was raised by my mother's best friend and her family. To this day, to this day, as a fully grown man, if I go to Brooklyn, New York, I go to the Campbells and the Bishops and I go to my own blood relatives because they're, that's like a part of me, the families that are here they have a birthday, a wedding, I'm there. Because they raised me. And they're, they're the, elder, the elders in the, in, in, the, um, in the bishop family. If those men today tell me, Charlie, stop. I, that's it. I, I, I want to say no, but they raised me as a child. So all of this was just automatic. It was nothing special, right? So when I'm hearing this, I'm saying, but Tamari, that's nothing special. Everybody did that. But what I'm realizing in this particular context, living in Canada, North America, the model of the nuclear family, the model of the father and the father's relationship to the, to the family, all is built on the assumption the father has access to resources, right? And therefore, because he has access to resources, guaranteed non-problematic access to resources, he can be the father the culture promotes. You bring up a topic I wanna to, to touch on. Sure. But you know what, I, I gotta pay homage to it for a moment. You know, I just, it just, it just dawned on me, right? And Tamari, how you, you just speak of Charles just now, is how I view you. You know, like, I, I, I it just, I'm just well, seeing the circle of life right here. You know, like, Man, I appreciate you, man, because, you know, 
folks, you know, I'm gonna be vulnerable with folks, you know what I mean? Like, I remember there was times where, you know, tomorrow would give me some hard truths, even in public. You know, I had to swallow that. You know, I was like, man, this guy's coming hard, but I never took it as like, he was trying to, you know, public shame me or, or any of that, you know? I, I took he was trying to better me, you know? And how I heard him speak about Charles, man, thank you. You know, like, man, always appreciate it, man. But um, I want to talk about something you said, Charles, real quick. Um, and I know we, we got a question we were supposed to follow, but you mentioned something where I was I was jogging today. Yeah, I went for a 6K jog, it happened. And, um, you know, it dawned on me that children are a commodity. And that's what I'm hearing you, you, you speak of. And, you know, you know, just, and folks at home, when I'm using the word commodity, I'm, I'm going to then paint the picture in people's minds here where children are used as the prize, if I can say it that way. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I'm just going to throw it back to you two here. You know, and, and Charles, you were alluding to that. Um, when we talk about this, you know, children as this prize or this commodity, if you have, if the father has access to resources, you know, it's like these children are being dangled by the carrot. And if, and if they don't reach, if these fathers aren't able to provide, then they automatically are titled the, the, the demonized father or, you know, the absent father or the, the, or the, or the, or, or the, or whatever baby, baby daddy you can think of. What, what comes to mind when you think that? Okay. I was thinking that the economic deprivation for black men. Yeah. yeah. We become a morality tale for all others. Can you can you spell that this a little bit more? When I say when I say morality tale, I mean that if you are a young black man in the city of Toronto, mm -hmm. Montreal, for example, you got a bachelor's degree. Your next best competitor, is somebody pres presumably white, with grade ten or eleven, and if you're in the work world. Your pay is 20 to 30 percent less than the white guy working beside you. Same amount of years, right? So, black the 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 image of the derelict black man, the deadbeat black father, that is the image. That's the morality tale for all others. That that's where you can be if you don't discipline yourself. And I think one of the things that we need to understand about the world as it is constructed, and we talk a lot about patriarchy. We need to understand that patriarchy is about men dominating other men. So Charles talked about some men do not have the means to manifest that image, that trope, that stereotype, right? Black men struggle against that stereotype because they're penalized for being black and men. And they then have to bring themselves up in a world where they do not have access to employment and other things the same way that other men have. And in fact, they become commodities. So when you're stopped by the cops, when you're put into prison, right, you become a commodity for, for other people's economic development. Yeah. And so we have that issue going on where if you are a young black man with a bachelor, of, a bachelor degree, you're competing with someone who's got grade 10 or 11, then Think about what that means when you're trying to start a family, right? So we literally need to have a regime where we connect young black men with older black men to help to explain to them that being a man doesn't always mean being a provider. It means being a spouse. It means being a mentor. It means being an other father. As much as you enrich other people's lives, you can get your life enriched too. Yeah. And the, the, the key point, you know, I, I'd like to make is that, with reference to this, it's not so much, you don't become a commodity automatically, yes? You see, we're, we're, we're coming into Canada yeah. as immigrants to Canada, right? If you were in the Caribbean, you never ever had to worry about the males or male leadership. It was never, it, it was never so formalized. It was just expected, right? I'll give you an example. If you were young, let's say we were all young. We were all on the age 10. You're eight years of age. You're the eldest among a group of children from say age four to eight. And one of them decides he's gonna just, just walk away. He's just gonna stray. And the adults see him wherever. 
and they walk into the yard where you were playing marbles. And they ask, they look around, and they know that you, Charlie, you're the eldest. But you play marbles like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that you are supposed to be responsible for everyone else that's there, right? And you're getting an ass whipping. Because the lesson is, when you are the eldest, you are responsible for whomever else is younger than you, no matter what the activity. And if they go home and cry that Charlie beat them, they get a lot of beating. Because the lesson is, when your mother and father are not there, he is the one that's responsible, as you, when it's your turn, will be responsible for the younger one. So we're looking at an environment in the Caribbean, right? African descendant, enslaved African descendant, right? Where you're being taught, coming from our ancestry, at any point in time, right? The man called your father, the one who Steve made you, might not be there, right? So to preserve family, all hands on deck. Right? So hardship comes, the mother has more children than she can handle, auntie steps in, takes one. Uncle Tech steps in, takes, takes another. Right? Cousin so also takes one. The neighbor who doesn't have a child, the community makes sure she has a child, she has a child to take care of. There are many peoples in our communities all across the Caribbean that have those non-traditional, non-traditional referencing European conceptions of family in their lineage. Right? The name of the game for our community is to get you to adult life, two feet, no problems, so you could progress, right? But when we come here, it changes. Mm. When we come here, that taken for granted assumption or body of assumptions that you are responsible for other people goes out the window because your providers are in a market where they have to go out every day, compete, make money and come home to provide for you. That support system ain't there. There's no aunt, no sister, no grandmother, no grandfather, no neighbor that you could trust to take care of your children. For somebody to take care of your child or children, you gotta pay them. So we've gone from community, communal expectations, kinship, right, to cash, right? Back home it ain't cash. Back home, oh, you know what? Warren by, no, no. Check that, hold that, hold that for a time. Okay, Warren goes home to his wife. Um, Charlie, give me some money. Yeah, take a little thing. Which means, look, when better comes for him, you'll be taken care of. Your family's in on it, right? When the check comes from England, the money comes from England, Canada, or the US to take care of us, Warren, don't worry about it, here's a bag of rice, boom. Here's some potato, boom. You know that bill you got at this, the chin, I'll cover it for you. Boom, right? You know your back is covered when hardship hits, right? Here. It's not that here, here you're on your own. Here, balance into reciprocity. You're on your own here. We have reciprocity, mm -hmm. it's a reciprocity of cash. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Back home, we have reciprocity, it's a reciprocity of support and love against hardship and suffering. Because suffering is what we are being trained to endure. Because mm. dignity comes without cash. We don't need money to have dignity. But you need money to have dignity here. So I'm gonna get to the, the questions. Thank you for that. Do you wanna add anything? I wanna to follow on that, that. This is why we see community organizations doing what they do in Canada. Mm. We've had an organization here at uh, Centennial College, that's where they're now located, the African Canadian Heritage Association. They're like they've been around for like almost 60 years. We used to have the Harriet Tubman Center, the yeah. Black Education Project. Yeah. And now what you're doing at Ottawa with ACMP, this is part of a legacy where we understand that this is a market-driven society. And so we need alternative places and spaces to enable our young to flourish, yeah. right? And that's what ACMP does. That's what all these other community organizations do the church groups, the, the Muslim and the Imam, bringing together the youth together on a Friday night, whatever the case may be, that's what's happening there, right? We're building that capacity to nurture youth. Yeah, and the key, 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 is to have them live communally, live knowing they are not alone in the world. Because 
here we have to be formal about it. We've got to form an organization called African, African Canadian so-and-so. We have to form an organization. We have to get a license. We have to get a tax code. Mm -hmm. In Guyana, your family is the tax code, right? Your uncle with a job at the docks, he is the tax department. You behave yourself, you get a reward. You don't behave yourself, you don't get no money, right? That family is everything. That community is everything, right? But here, right, because that support is absent and we have to be formal about it, right, it flexes differently. Now, what does that mean? It means if you're a young male growing up here and you don't have access to those people in that organization that other people are part of, you're losing political skills. You're losing skills you need to function in this society, right? To be able to negotiate authority, to, 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 to challenge authority. If the cops come and they want to close down the facility at one o'clock as opposed to 12, you have a license to go until two. You know, because you see the adults, listen, this is the license we could do. You know, you could talk to the police. You don't have, you, you, you don't have to be afraid. You have law you could stand on to defend your interests. All of that you get outside the home when you're in these organizations. And if you look, people who come out of an, an activist tradition function very differently in this society to those who have no conception of such a life because they know where power rests and they know how to address power. They do not have fear because they know power like them as individuals is accountable to law, right? In the old country, the law is whatever this community determines it's going to be, right? You beat your wife, you beat her too often, you know what? Brethren, you can't stay around here again. I don't want my daughter or my son seeing you beating this, this girl. She's a good person, you gotta step. If you don't step, we make you step. That kind of way, right? The community will police itself, right? But I'm talking old times. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to get to the questions, all right? And we were talking about so to, to, to you know, bring the conversation back to this myth. Of, we're talking about it. We are talking about it. So hang tight, folks. We're going to get to some questions in a moment because that's all point of barbershop talk. It's not just hearing Warren and people talk, right? But this is this is this is like important information, and I trust that people are, are getting getting these gems as they're coming. Um, but you know, one of the questions that we started talking about it. So I'm going to ask, and, and what I want to just offshoot it to another question as well, respectfully. Um, the question is, you know, we talked about it again, like I said, but uh, what makes the missing black father myth? And how does the, um, the nuclear family fit into it? So I've had conversations with men whose fathers were present, yeah. but they were emotionally absent. They were remote from their sons. They were antagonistic. And what I figured out with those men, as I figured out through my relationship with my father, is watching this man go to work five o'clock in the morning, come home at like four or five o'clock at night, exhausted. And I got to learn that this man was putting himself on the line every single day by going out to work. I didn't understand that he was not like my white friend's fathers who took them to baseball games, right? I got to understand that my father was teaching me life lessons that I didn't know that I was learning. And so when I grew up now, and now as a professor, I'm doing research on black men and I'm seeing this narrative pop up, pop up, and I realized that when I was growing up, from six months to eight years old, my grandfather was my father. When I came to Canada, my biological father was my father, but then there were times when my uncle stepped in, right? So I was never without a male figure to guide me. Even when my father, being present, was not available emotionally, right? So I think what happens is that when we project this myth based on the, like Charles was saying about the nuclear family, yeah. we miss out on all the ways that black men are part of the lives of young black men, guiding and enculturating them in, and, in, into the maturity of manhood.
I appreciate that. And um, sorry, I, I'm going to ask the, the the actual question here because um, I think there's we kind of covered some of that, and there's other questions. So obviously, I think people want to hear, but I want to hear Charles and follow up too uh, as I invoke this question here. Um, is slavery a, con a contribution, a contributing factor to the myth, to the myth of the missing black box? Okay, 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 okay. Now we got to step back. Now we're getting into some heavy territory. Yeah, now, I think right? so. Okay. I think so. This is what yeah. happens in the barbershop. Yeah, but it's gonna be heaviness. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you this. If I had not read the books that I read, yeah, outside of the university, yeah. right, I wouldn't be where I am now, right, and provide you with the answer that I have now. I, I can give to you. Uh, Third World Bookstore was an independently owned Black Canadian bookstore. And I went there on, when they were on Bay Street, and I went there when they were on Bathurst Street, right? And Lenny Johnson had the books. And when you read those books, this question was answered. In other words, family, okay, there are all kinds of families. There's no one family, right? If you privilege or you promote the nuclear family, the small family, mother, father, sister, brother, dog, you know, right? These days, right? Bicycle, right? Right? When you promote that that vision as the family, you're telling the rest of us who come out of other types of families something is wrong about us. But if the outcome is the same, right? We have healthy, mature adults who can interact with people and negotiate power and go to work and have discipline, hygiene, and so on. Then why is this system, this one particular way of living? The only way, the only way to make a family, right? And it must be said in the North American context, American Canada, the nuclear family is a powder keg, a powder keg of violence, inequity, insecurity, competition, etc. I mean, in a brief detour, I'm talking to a school, a university pal. She's telling me about. When the Italians left Toronto and moved to Woodbridge, Ontario, which is a suburb just outside of Toronto, the war in these nuclear Italian families was to make sure no one had, in terms of possessions, what you did not have. In other words, now, they never, these people, the, when they, they first moved, they never parked their car in the garage, even though they had a garage. Their cars were parked on what do you call it again the driveway, the driveway right yeah. right and it not it wasn't a car you drove for function the car was for show because you're saying i i in the house you know you don't necessarily own it and i have this car so i'm what like the jeffersons i'm moving on up yeah. right yeah. right 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 to the sky right and so if you the neighbor you have the home the house but you have a secondhand Buick Century that's seen some life and probably has a few more lives to go. Oh, they're not playing the game by the rules. Yeah? They're not, they don't really belong. They're poor. Yeah? When they go to the Loblaws, they're not coming back with a whole trunk full of food. They're poor. Right? So the name of the game in the nuclear family, the nuclear family is designed to consume. Right? This society needs that. The families that we're, come, we're coming from were designed for us to survive. So when you look at people who come from that kind of family, right? They are emotionally sturdy, they're strong, they're tough, and they know how to suffer, and they know tomorrow is another day. That's how we were raised. We weren't raised to consume. We were raised to, raised to confront life's challenges, even those not yet born. Let me give you an example quickly. If you talk to us in the Caribbean, especially some places, Africa as well, we used to get the beatings back in the day. If you tell Canadians, white Canadians, and those who are acculturated Canadians about the beatings, they say, oh, your parents were terrible. Oh, this is disgusting, a tra trauma, yeah. But when trouble came into our lives, we had the matter to overcome those struggles and get on with life. When struggle came into their lives, what did they do? Liquor, drugs, 
abuse, etc. So, because you have the family, the nuclear family, because you have a community raising you, you could see different options in how, what type of human being you can become. You can make your choices and shape the life that you're going to live. You saw the buddy, the young man who was drunk, always who broke. You could say, well, no, I'll never drink alcohol and I'll always make sure I keep my job, right? You have these models that can train you. When you're a nuclear family, your training is not the family and the community. Your training is the TV set. Right? So when trouble comes to you now, you fall apart because you don't have a model, you don't have images in your head of people overcoming. Yeah? But we do. Right? And that's why when we when when it comes to the the the, the myth as you say of the absent father, as Tamari rightly rightly says, the concept of the father has to be redefined to, to explain to us why we have chosen the options that we've chosen given our history, right? Because in our communities, if you are the elder, if you're the, the uncle and your nephew is in hardship and you're not at the plate to help, you're gonna have to pay a price, bro. You have a lot of explaining to do to a lot of people, right? Because you are the mother's support system, right? And the father's support system, and that child support system still in this country in spite of everything right so it's a myth for us because we live under the myth and we see the reality of the alternative right mm. but it's a reality for other people right because they gain a sense of superiority over us because they have mother father sister brother right they gain the superiority because they've got the house and they own it they gain the sense of superiority because they've got the job and they're getting promoted, right? And they're working days. And whereas my mother is working nights and weekends and three jobs a month with two children, yeah? Trying her best, right? And the son gets a PhD. The mother fails her nursing exam four times, gets it the fifth time. We're all together, we're okay, right? In my PhD program, many people started, many people dropped out. I finished. Where did that attitude come from? Life of struggle, right? So my point is, what when it comes to the absent family, the absent father, it's part of a network of mythological, of, of, of stereotypical mythologies about black people, people of African heritage. Remember, am I talking too much? Shoot, man. <laughs> okay. We have had over four to five hundred years living with Europeans. In our case, right, let's be specific, we're not the only black people in the world, right? We speak English, the dominant commercial language in the world, right? So hip, hip, hooray. My mass is better than the French, the, 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 the brother who comes from Martinique who speaks French, because my master rules the world. So my mass is better, yeah? Okay. Slave talk, yeah? Okay. Stupid, but hey, you gotta have something if you got nothing, right? Okay, so now, dig this. We've come from four to 500 years of living with Europeans. We therefore have in our bloodstream, our DNA, living with Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christians. We know them better even than they know themselves. We've had to study them, right? Because we had to carve out what little pieces of freedom in everyday life we could under this monumental oppression. Now you put yourself on the side of being a white European. It's okay, man, it's all right, it's called life. It's called life, it's okay. Um, we've had 500 years of living. Now, for us, right, we have survived the very worst that they could do to us as English-speaking Africans, our Portuguese-speaking brothers, French-speaking brothers, Spanish-speaking brothers, the same. Brothers and sisters, the same, right? Put yourself in the position of a European now. If they know that all the hangings, all the rapes, the disembowelments, all the, the, the nail in your neck and the nail in your hand, the starvation, the poisonings, and we are still here. Like, what is it about these people? How do you survive?
because it's Chris Rock. Am I dropping the gun? Go for it. Yeah. Chris Rock said something, the comedian. Chris said, look, the one thing he's known, he's learned from white people, is that however much they like our music, our this and our that, the one thing he knows, they will never exchange places with us. Because they will always say, oh my God, I don't know how you guys do it. Right? That is the reality of the life that we live. The myth is, we have no fathers, therefore we ought not to be given any respect. We're lesser beings. So when a society or a group of people invest so much energy into claiming superiority, right, which in itself is a myth, right, they have to find ways of generating that superiority. And the myth and the stereotypes have to be created and reproduced. If you don't do that, right, then you stop dehumanizing us. And when you stop dehumanizing us, you start to put us in a position to be human beings. And if that happens, superiority and supremacy collapses. Because you can't be superior to somebody who is yourself. You can't be superior to yourself. Or you're equal to. Or you're equal to, yeah. right? You can only be superior to someone other than yourself. Which you other. So we're gonna take a quick break, all right? Because uh, folks, I didn't tell people we got giveaways. Yeah, so don't leave, all right? Uh, but before we we, uh, we we showcase those giveaways, uh, we'll come back to tomorrow. Uh, get your your your, touch, your your points on that. Um, and also, Jamal, are you still there? Um, still there? I'm assuming you're still there. Please be there, Jamal. You know, we want to hear you speak. I'm here. Ah, there you are. Whew, Jamal, can you can you can you enlighten us with your poetry, your beautiful poetry, please? All right, so folks, this is a treat on behalf of Jamal, the poet. Please do your thing. Thank you, and we're gonna come right back, finish up discussion, then we're gonna get into the group discussion. All right, please enjoy. Much love, much love. This is an important conversation. It's something that I think about a lot. I'm a father of six, and my wife and I, um, you know, we chose a, a path uh, when it comes to uh, raising our family and, and, and bringing children into this world, we chose a path that's uh, quite unorthodox. Um, I agree that nuclear family statement, that was powerful. Uh, thank you for the wisdom you brothers are sharing. Such a powerful, powerful uh, gathering today. I have a poem, uh, it's dedicated to my father. Uh, my father was, for all intents and purposes, a single black, a single black father, Guyanese, uh, and the struggles he went through I witnessed. Uh, just to say quickly, um, one of the things that I find as I want to pass on and carry on the tradition, one of the things that I find that's really difficult is knowing that my father, you know, had to go through all those difficulties, like we were talking about the, the, the father that's not emotionally connected with their children or absent in a sense of, you know, um, just distant, uh, but in terms of the, your emotions, seeing what my father went through and of course being raised like that, breaking generational you know, patterns is really is really difficult. It's something that I'm dealing with in my life right now. How do I not? How do I not be an emotionally distant uh, father, right? So there's 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 um, when, while we talk about, of course, you know, uh, the myth and debunking those myths, also, you know, how do we not continue to use stories and narratives that we that don't serve us anymore? My children don't need to experience the life and the raising that I experienced because they're in a better position than I was. So I'm thinking about that too, and I hope maybe someone asked that question and, and the two intelligent, uh, the two intellectuals can give us some advice about not continuing perhaps stories or narratives as black men that we don't need anymore because perhaps we've been able to raise the bar as we are trying to do for our families and our community. Uh, this poem is titled, uh, My Father, and it goes like this. <clears throat> this one goes out to my father. You did the best you could with me. Throughout all of your circumstances, I just want to let you know that I'm forever indebted to you, tethered to you, never to be severed from you because the man I am now, the man I have become, is due to the man you were with me, due to our friendship and intimacy. I want to let you know that you didn't mess up with any of your children. And I thank you for the heartwarming moments you shared with me and how you tried with me because you couldn't bear to see another one of your children slip through your hands. And I wonder how you didn't crumble under all that pressure, under all those struggles you had to suffer, when you had no one but yourself, but your hustle and your muscle. And on those nights when you would cry, I never asked why. 
Because I knew you were singing a June ghetto birds tune and those swoons you would do would make the moon cry too. And when I listened to my room, daddy, I would cry too. But due to your pride, you would hide all the pain you were going through. And with only wind and rain in the horizons, what else could a ghetto bird do but fly ghetto skies and live a ghetto bird's life? And during your young life, opportunities came knocking. But you were never good at responding because you stayed heavily rocking, going to bed with a black, green, and red stocking in your head because in those days, you were heavily knocking. And when the black got hot, you never got caught by the feds or the cops. You always told me you had heavenly angels watching. And even though you let yourself slip to the crack, you never let us slip through the cracks because you knew society could crack a whip harder than you could move crack on a strip. So you stayed on your jobs 24 seven, graduated from university and had six children and a wife with a mental illness whom you promised me was promised heaven. And so your wound stayed open like a 7-Eleven leaving no space and time for mental, physical, spiritual healing, dealing with your five sons, your one daughter. You did this all alone, working those hard Guyanese black fingers to the bone. This is what you did for us when your only friends were the six boroughs of Toronto and your abode was the concrete jungle and the ghetto was where you roam. This is what you did. And even though, even though growing up under your school of hard knocks was tough, I can't imagine how you found the time to sit down on the rough ground and eat with us those delicious meals, scarce of meat for us, but with plenty of rice. So this one rightly goes out to my father. And in spite of what anyone ever utters concerning your character, I solemnly swear to defend you vehemently because you taught me the truth. And now I do defend it vehemently because in spite of what anyone ever utters concerning my father, when they tell me that he was too rough on me, I reply, well, I'm happy that he wasn't too easy or too lazy to clothe me, to hold me, to scold me, to feed me, to teach me, to sow a seed in me, to remind me of the need to be a creature of integrity. If it wasn't for what my father had taught me, I most surely, most likely, most probably would have been a criminal mind involved in fraudery and debauchery. So I ask you to forgive me. And being late in writing and reciting this dedicated poetry, and I hope you accept it as a present, as a token of my most sincerest gratitude, because without your sacrifice, I would not carry in life such an optimistic attitude. So before it's too late, I got to big you up. I got to let you know that I love you and that you're a good man and that I'm thankful that you gave me life and that I'm proud to be called your son. So I wrote that, uh, that poem on Father's Day um, for my father. And... It's, it's a note, of course, to Black fatherhood. And so I hope you, um, you know, were able to glean any gems from it. Thank you for listening. And Warren, thank you for having me here. Bless up to the individuals. Have a great weekend. Jamal, well, always great. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. And also we have, um, just so folks know, uh, we do have two giveaways. Um, Ethos Beard Grooming Kids will be... Um, um, you know, it raffled off uh, towards the end of the evening. Um, so if you have a beard, trust me, this is the, they call it the holy grail of beard care. Um, so if you are interested in uh, getting one of your hands on one of those kits, please stay tuned. Um, so we're coming back now, all right? So tomorrow, um, so the question was, is slavery connected to this myth of the absent uh, black father? Um, any thoughts? I'd have to say yes and no. Okay. But before I say answer yes or no, I want to pick up on a point that Jamal made. Yeah, please. And which is that when I was growing up, I imagined my father as invulnerable, not susceptible to pain or injury. It's only when I became a father that I realized what pain and injury my father was living with. And that capacity to understand and to empathize with him who had his group of friends for sure right but these these men increasingly had to struggle in canada i remember one of my my father's cousins one of my older cousins telling me that they used to bring these guys down to the police stations put phone books on their abdomens and beat it with a billy club you couldn't see any bruises that's what those men lived with back in those days so i i cannot Increasingly, I came to understand that I had to forgive my father because he did not have access to the resources that I did and he did the best he could. Only then was my relationship with my father changed. So back to this issue of slavery. 
Slavery is relevant because after about 1650, slavery became a status passed through the mother. So fathers technically became redundant in law. So many scholars would now look at slavery and imagine that black men did not father, could not exercise fatherhood. But when you read the works of those serious scholars that interrogate slavery, as Charles pointed out when you read those books, how then do you explain in Jamaica alone from 1655 till 1834, 400 slave rebellions at least, right? What were these men and women doing except not struggling for life to build families, to build the capacity to live and to live freely? So that's the myth if you look only at the law, right? But the fact of the matter is that these men did struggle did resist, did father. And as I pointed out, whether it's on the slave ship or on the plantation, when one man was sold off, another man stepped in, the brother, the uncle, the grandfather. So there's never a shortage of black men. And I think Jamal is quite right when we talk about the narrative. It's a narrative. If we reframe the narrative and get outside the box of the nuclear families, Charles is saying, like, we need to get outside that box. Then we can reimagine what black fathering and other fathering looks like to have a different conversation that brings us to a deeper understanding of how black men actually engage fathering even during slavery. So I'm, I'm, so I'm, that's what I'm saying, it's a yes and a no, yeah, yeah, yeah. that the narrative, the stereotypes, the tropes are based on the nuclear family, which itself is a mythology when you look at divorce rates being 50 to 60%. This is serial monogamy, if it is that at all. So there's something about the nuclear family that helps us to misunderstand how to understand black men and how we father, mentor, and other father. You know, I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I hear, you know, mentoring and the, the concept that you bring the other fathering. Um, you know, bring this, this guy right here. Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. You know, this, this is like my son right here, you know, and, um, you know, I appreciate him and I appreciate the opportunity for me to be in his life the way he's allowed me to. Because he could have been like, listen, I don't, you're, you're not my real dad. You know what I mean? He could have done that. Um, so, me even being in his life to be able, be able to say, hey, this is my guidance, this is what I'm, I'm able to offer you. And then still coming out here and say, hey, come out here and sit in here and learn something. And he's like, all right, go, I'm coming. You know, I can see the relevance of that other, the other father you speak of, which is important. Right, and I think we, I think this is an opportunity for our community to embrace that, right, and to debunk this myth, because there's other types of fatherhood going on that we, I think, we don't we don't talk about enough. You know, yes, exactly. It, it, it's that we must we must debunk the myth, but we must understand that the myth is part of a family of myths. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a community of myths, an ecosystem of myths, and these myths all have one singular purpose, right? Which is to keep peoples of African heritage mentally, right? Um, locked in to these myths as real. Like we are sitting here as African, like we're most of us, I think one, two, th one, two, three. We're probably the fourth or fifth generational descendant from enslaved Africans. If you were born between 55 to 75, you would probably, that would be the fourth to fifth generation removed from the abolition of slavery. If you take an 80 to 100 year cycle. And if, if it's in the Latin Americas, it's 1888. So you're talking about three generations. Three generations yeah. removed, right? So it's still fresh. It's not 10 generations yet. It's still fresh, right? And the way we were raised was, was to, 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 to negotiate potential suffering on the plantation, right? Cutting the cane in the Americas, planting the cotton, right? And working in the sugar mill, where if you make a mistake, <laughs> your arm is gone, yeah? So, so the discipline of everyday life was to make sure you kept your hand when you went into the plantation. Because if you learn to obey authority, which is coming from those who went before you, you will live long. That's gone, right?
point being made, this community of myths, this ecosystem of myths, all of them have one singular purpose. It's to make you feel you are living in a world, a universe of inferiority. You are inferior. Let me give you some of the other myths. Number one, all black men are criminal. Number two, all black men like to have sex. Number three, all black men are drug dealers. Number four, all black people are lazy. Number five, black women are sexually promiscuous. And it, the list goes on, right? I listened one time, I listened to um, uh, Dutch, um, and that, they, they stopped it, but um, Radio Hilversum, which was the shortwave radio station for um, Holland, right? They don't have it anymore. One night, this anthropologist is talking about Surinamese Africans. They're, they're from what we call Dutch Guyana, right? Which is right next door to English British Guyana. And I'm listening to this and I'm saying, oh my God, I could be listening, reading the Toronto Sun at the time, which was filled with the same stereotypes and mythologies, right? Absent father, um, uh, uh, um, uh, promiscuous mothers, lazy men, promiscuous, I mean, just went on, I, said, this is, I wanted to say, this is racist, but I taught myself, right, to never accept the ideas that are coming to me, but to try always to find what rests below the ideas, below the concepts, because the other dimension that cannot be seen that's the dimension where reality is lived. Here's the paradox. You cannot see it, but that's where life is lived. In the Quran it says, Allah says, peace be upon him. Believe in the unseen. In the Bible, it says, faith, the belief in things unknown, the evidence of things not seen. So what you cannot see, like the CC, the closed circuit TV in the shopping mall, right? That's the reality, of, that's power. You can't see it. It sees you. It judges you. And you don't know it exists. Right? So when they come and came to me with those concepts, I would hear them. I would question them. Let me give you an example. Why are you saying sexually promiscuous? Because you have to deal as a people, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, Christians, with the fact you know if you were like those people, Africans who are enslaved, and resisting enslavement and making families and losing leaderships, right? That if you were them, you would commit suicide. You would commit suicide because you do not have, right, the moral fiber to live through that measure of scorn, scapegoating, hate, right, and dehumanization. You just don't have it. Remember quickly, remember, I mean, we spoke about this recently, about 19. Around 1990, Oprah Winfrey interviewed a young European-American male who decided he was going to reproduce. There's a book called, check this out, folks. The book is called Black Like Me, written by John Howard Griffin. It was published way back in the 1960s. And this is a European-American man who, during the Civil Yes, he, yeah, he yeah, took yeah, melanin, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he became the darkness complexion. And he traveled throughout the South during the um, uh, human rights movement in America. Uh, and, and, he, and he wrote this book. And in the book, he's talking about how he experienced being a man of African heritage, because that's how he was perceived by European Americans, right? This young man was going to, to, to reproduce that book, that journey, in the 19, 1990s. He was about maybe mid-20s, 25, 26. He was working for the New York Times, I think, or the Washington Post. And he was going to do this journey. So he left, he left New York City and he was going to take the Greyhound bus all the way to the south. I think he got off somewhere in North Carolina. And he decided, you know what? I've had enough. I can't handle this. So Oprah asks him, like, why did you stop? He said, Oprah, I couldn't handle it. Being watched every minute, being surveilled every minute people looking at me, people questioning me, women holding their purses, people crossing the street, I go into stores, people come to me to ask me, like, what am I doing here? What can I do, etc." 
right? People are saying this thing and saying and treating him this way. And he said, you know, he said he gave the story. He was in a taxi. No, no, he was at a bus stop in New York City, I think. And he's talking to people. And he forgot that he's black. He's, he's talking to them like a white man would talk to white people. And when he saw their responses, he realized, oh, 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 this is what it means to be black. Because they were telling him, hey, listen, nigger. Hey, hey, you don't talk to me that way. And he realized, my God, this is the project that I'm starting. Good grief. This is what black people have to go through. You mean I'm trying to get a taxi and taxis are just going past me? Then he realized, yeah. In other words, as Chris Rock said, I am not going to exchange places with you. So that fundamental primal fear of the African, given what we have experienced at their hands, where we created wealth over which we had no control, puts them in a position, once slavery is officially abolished, of having to live among a people whom they scorn, hate, and fear, right? So enslavement is the source code for what has come to be. The struggle for us as we go forward in a democratic society where we have the right to own property in our own name, yes, we can have children, wives, husbands, right? And all be legitimated in law, right? It means now, that we are living among people who still hate and fear us. Because the legacy for their community remains. How, where do you people get this spirit to live with so much hate and scorn? Because what it means is, if I tell myself I'm superior to you, then I'm superior to you up to and including death. And if you have survived, then my power is only a power in my own imagination. Put yourself in that place. What does that tell you? That you're living a fantasy. If you truly believe you're superior, how do you live with this feeling when it's only a feeling? Because the evidence of it and its limitations is the African and the native person too. Those are the two groups. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, um, we got to get the, the audience involved, all right, because they're, they're patiently waiting and we got the, the timer, the timekeeper, like, hey, <laughs> all right. But, um, and I'm sure there's going to be questions directed uh, to both of you, probably, or whoever who is here want to ask questions as well. But um, uh, before we get to that, I just want to give uh, a shout out to Bull and Root Salon. Uh, are you still there, Bull and Root Salon? Because yes, they've renovated their place. We want to, we got to give them a shout out here, right? So we got to give them a quick shout out. Bull, Roots, and, and Roots Salon, folks. Are you guys there? Yeah, we are. Um, it's, hi, my name is Bull and uh, Abram as well. As we're partners. Thank you. Please, yeah. introduce yeah, yourself here. and share, share your barbershop with us. Talk, talk to us. Oh, um, <laughs> oh, I can stand. Oh. There you go. I don't even know what to look like either the screen or here. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Bull. Uh, Abraham is, uh, he's just uh, moving around. Uh, he's a barber. Um, we appreciate the opportunity. We're, uh, we own this place and uh, we've been at it for about two years now from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And we are going to be, uh, we're going to be um, moving over to the next spot and we, go, we are going to be here as well. So we're renovating right now, we're, re we're in the middle of renovation. That's why it doesn't look all fancy, but uh, it is a place for, for a lot of people to feel welcome. Um, we're trying our best to be inclusive as much as we can. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of uh, good, uh, good people here that work here. And yeah, i not too sure. Moses is here. He's one of our uh, stylists and a barber. Uh, how's the haircuts going out there? Talk to us. Is that, is that, is that, <laughs> is that a fade? What's going on? It's doing all good. We're just trying as best uh, we can, you know. Um, there's a few times, yeah, we have like ups and downs, but, you know, it's, it's the part of the uh, the struggle and, uh, you know, the process. 
But uh, all in all, it is, it's turning out good. good. Uh, yeah, we've been going off for like a year now, so it'll take us more than that to like, you know, get everything else uh, all in order. But yeah, we are working on it. <laughs> um, uh, Moses, uh, he's the other stylist, our, uh, and also a barber too. So uh, he's been doing great for so the last year too. And uh, I don't know if you want to say something, Moses? Yeah, so I want to thank you guys for this opportunity. And the other thing, I just want to say, I'm here to make people look good. Uh, no matter what is going on all over in the world right now, but we keep and press on for God is great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there you go. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you can't forget um, Saturday Night Life Barbershop, um, who I mentioned as well at the beginning. Um, Akram, can, can, we, can we give a shout out? Can we yeah, give a shout sure, out here? Sure. Akram's right here, one of the you know um, co-owners of this uh, barbershop that we're sitting in right now. Akram's a few words, maybe this. Hey, how's it going, guys? Yeah, one of the co-owners of Saturday Life Barbershop. Um, okay, okay. The shop started with the me and my friend. We wanted to create a safe environment for the black community, as well as our community where we grew up. We just grew up down the street. Um, so we want to create a fresh, clean environment for everyone to come through the youth to come get free haircuts in the beginning. That's how we started. You see that our, our name out there. But I see what you guys are doing there. It's great. It looks awesome. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. There we go. So, you know, like, like, you know, solidarity can't exist. You know, like two different barbershops, two different provinces you know, doing your thing, right? So this is the whole spirit of what barbershops really meant to do is not only connect people, but to show the relevance of why we're doing this. Um, not, you know, and part of the reason is to, to, you know, educators have learned and understand that, you know, these myths are just myths. There's more to it. But needless to say, um, we're going to open up the space now to questions from the audience uh, that can be asked of the two guests, uh, or, um, guests here who are tonight, uh, Charles and Tamari. Uh, so we'll open it up now. All right, and um, let's start. With, if there's any questions in the chat, we'll we'll read those off and trust that we can mention the person's name. I think there's a few. I, I saw a few. All right, so we've got a question here. Are we moving? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so um, I, I'm not sure the, the name here. Um, so the question is, and this goes to either Charles or Tamaria. Uh, the value of black is beautiful should be upheld in all facets of our lives. How do black fathers see the beauty of being the head of a family, leading them to achieve this, uh, uh, achieve a set goal? Once we see the value of leading our family to achieve a set goal, we will take responsibility regardless of the cost. So there's a statement and a question in there. Any, any response? Tamaria, yeah. I have to think mm, carefully about the way we frame the issue of leadership. Um, black men are paying a heavy cost for imagining that they're leaders of their families, uh, physically, psychologically. And I think that we need to begin to take a step back and reframe the narrative because that leadership can look like different things in different ways. And it can mean now being, uh, leading can be equal partnership. Like I have to, it's a very strange thing, but I show leadership in my family by following my children. Mm -hmm. My children say to me, daddy, you're, you're, you've been at the computer for 12 hours, 14 hours, 15 hours. You need to stop, mm -hmm. right? How much more do you have to work? So I think that we as men need to look at the cost that we're paying for the narrative, an older narrative, like Jamal says, that like we, there's certain narratives that we need to let go of, and we can let go of that narrative and still exercise leadership. Because this is how my, I'm now leading my families literally by following them and listening to their advice um, and beginning to take care of myself. If I didn't, I would not be taking care of myself and harming the entire family. So I think the question is, and comment is apt, but I think that there are different ways now of doing leadership. Well, I'll I, I respond this way. 
this 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 um, uh, um, session was about the, the myth of the absent father, right? And we talked about this myth existing in a community of myths, right? There are many other myths that have the same intention, which is to harm Africans psychologically, so that we we would be subordinate and come to the world with reflexes of subordination to white people, power, and so on, which we don't have because we have to survive, we have to be otherwise. This is an example of one of those myths, which is to say European cultures have the, the myth of the white patriarch, the white male patriarch, who is the dominant member of the family. In practice, it's the complete opposite. If he wants to be married, right, and have someone take out his, his bucket, at the end of the, uh, in the middle of the night and wipe him down when he gets cancer and other illnesses, he better make sure he respects the leadership and the decision-making authority of his wife. But the propaganda is that he's the man, right? And we have eaten that propaganda and we've swallowed that propaganda. So we come to it now in our own communities feeling that he must be the boss. He must sit at the top of the table and, 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 and cut the cake and cut the turkey and all of that, right? When the reality of our lives are, our wives, our mothers, our sisters, they are the ones that lead, they are the ones that guide and plan, and they're not getting that recognition. So for me, the ideal is that as a man, you have to understand that you are in a series of partnerships with your spouses, right? When you understand that it's a partnership, it's plain sailing because she has rights in that union, in that marriage, just as you, right? So it's really where you distance yourself from the myth of the white patriarch and you look at the reality of your life, which is a life of shared power and authority within the home, right? And when you realize that and you live that, smooth sailing. But but can, can I add something though? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's important also to understand that not every black father is resident in the home. Yeah. Right? Because when we look at the popul or the, the demographics of black communities in Canada, there are far more women than men. So there will always be more mothers than there are fathers. So and not every single relationship lasts. Right? But what we know is that non-resident black fathers are contributing to their families. And those men, I think, have a sense of democracy about how to exist with the mothers of their children, right? In ways that men who live with the spouses might have the notion of the male as leader, the male as patriarch. So to complicate it, as you were talking about, there's a multiplicity of ways that black men can lead is to understand that even those men that are non-resident, that those men can do, and I've seen these men exist in ways by contributing to their families, that demonstrates that they are leaders, but they're not, they're not actually resident, right? They're contributing in every single way to their families and providing that leadership. And, and a key, key point too, we have to understand that the women of our life, in our lives, black women, just as, as ourselves, are more educated formally and informally than their mothers were. Okay? They, like us, have access to much more information and knowledge about life and living than their mothers did. Right? They oftentimes have the certificates to have occupations their mothers can only dream about. They can plan their pregnancies. Their mothers just had pregnancies. They can plan their lives. Their mothers just had lives. So there is a difference. So when you're dealing with educated people, because they have the sense that they have a right in a liberal <clears throat> democratic culture to speak for themselves because they have rights in themselves, that kind of union is a much different union than the father in the old days who was the boss because he had a job and the boss because he made more money than the mother, whether married 
or on them. I want to cut to a question from Winnipeg. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan Charles. Uh, Winnipeg, what's the question, please? Um, I wanted to ask about the ACMP that you guys oh. were talking about before. And that's the really much, pretty much it because I didn't understand what it was. So, yeah. Okay, uh, so, uh, so that's, I guess, a question for me. So, the Afro Caribbean Mentorship Program, ACMP is the acronym, as you just mentioned, uh, is a mentorship program started in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, and it focuses on the academic development of African descent um, students within the, within the university, uh, and also uh, high school students. I should I also mention that as well. So what we focus on is how do we acknowledge that there is anti-black racism that exists within post-secondary education spaces, uh, but not only to um, you know uh, intentionally um, and actively um, you know challenge it, but to do uh, programming. Um, that empowers, um, educates, particularly those in the in the uh, university community who are um, who are not African descent, uh, because we still have to work with those partners. Uh, but doing everything in our possible way with uh, with folks in this space to uh, dispel that that um, sense of anti-black racism or anti-black racism itself, which disrupts uh, learning. So, I trust I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's more, you can learn more uh, at our website, weareacp.com, which we'll put on the chat. Uh, so I have another question. I, I'm not, I can't see the name. A Kofi? Uh, is that, is it, I can't see it from here. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's okay. I just had a question because, you know, a lot of times we hear, we're talking about myth, we're talking about stereotypes. Is there any research other than the Children Aid Society that African people develop the methodology to to research black men, father and children and, and developing relationships. Is this something that we ought to do? Because I don't think we have any proper, we do a lot of um, conjecture, like, you know, we say the thing, but we don't really have done any natural research from our perspective about this thing. Um, does anybody know of something that we have done that not the European white supremacy racist system conduct these research in their own racist methodology? I see tomorrow's gonna I want to I want tomorrow to go. I, do you mind if I just No 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 that's just that's just feeling yeah yeah okay so um, thanks for that question much appreciated um you know that's a relevant question because that's the whole um you know reason why we do this is because I think we can use this word myth, that there's a myth that there is no research done or there is no literature, but there, there is, right? And, um, you know, pointing to tomorrow, because I, I, I can see, you know, I, I feel energy here. So I think there's, there's something to you can say, but, you know, even just displaying tomorrow's book, that's evidence, you know, that a lot of people, a lot of people may or may not know, but no, you know now, um, you know, there's a lot of black scholars, but I want to stop there because I think I want to do this better to come, get, uh, come from Tamari and Charles, uh, respectfully, please. I, I, I love the question. Yeah. Because it should be saying to young men and women of African descent that we need our own researchers working in our own community organizations and, and, and working in the universities, conducting research in our communities on behalf of our communities. So um, we're literally at the ground floor in Canada of beginning to have scholars like Warren to do empirical research, research with a variety of African Canadian communities. And so we're at the beginning stages of this. Now, if you go, if you look at the work of people like Carl James, right, the work is there, right, but we don't yet have a critical mass. And I think we're only now beginning to have a critical mass of doing that sort of research that you're talking about around black fathers. It's, it's literally uh, beginning in the last, I'd say, 10 years, right? So it takes time to build a critical mass of scholarship. And that means encouraging our young men and women to attend university, right? So that we can build that knowledge base for ourselves. Sorry, I can't remember the name of that person, but um, how, do, how do you feel with that response there? No, no, definitely. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. But um, 
I also think it's um, the the academia space is okay, but we must know that the community, the the groundings, Walter Rodney has taught us that when you're in academia, the greatest education is the community, going into the villages, going into the spaces where young African people live, whether it's you know, doing this work that we do in a lot of these spaces, uh, to Toronto community housing before it was metro housing. A lot of our youths and our families live here and they live there and we need to go down there and create those critical communities. Why we, not every, all of us are going to academia. Some will go to college, some will do different things and entrepreneurship, but we need to be able to have a critical community conversation with our family as a group of people. And I respect that. I think, I think, um, sorry, Tamari, uh, really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think this forum is, is an example of that. Um, you know, we're bringing the, the community together. We're bringing the academics in with the community members, as you respectfully mentioned, of those who may not be thinking or, uh, or want to, or that's what they think or access to, but this is, I think this is the start of what you're saying. Um, I think we need to do more of this, and there's people doing it, you know, um, so I don't want to lose sight of that, but tomorrow, please. I hear what the brother's saying, Yeah. and I can't help but have a reaction. The university is the community. I, I think we need to begin to think about a different w way of framing the geography of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I understand that the community is one space in which particular forms of knowledge occurs, Yeah. but my concern is that it's, it, it creates this separation between the university and the community. And I don't think that that, that separation exists, right? Um, I think that these are different spaces in which knowledge is pursued. Yeah. So I did go to university with people from different marginalized communities in Toronto, and we were at least at York University, at U of T and these other places, we were able to create a form of collectivist knowledge that brought all of us together from different backgrounds and different perspectives. And we then circulated within those communities. So I hear what the brother is saying, and I think that we need to understand that the separation is not as sharp as people make it out to be, right? Um, and, you know, I think it's important that we Yes, talk about Walter Rodney, but Walter Rodney was in the university, right? He taught in the university, but he also taught in communities. So I think we should begin to think about this uh, in a much more less stark contrasting way that sets up those in the university as the academics. They're not a part of us because I tend to get that. You're not a part of us anymore because you're in the university. But I don't understand how I've been separated from the from the community because I'm a professor at a at a university, and I think we end up possibly getting into these sorts of conflicts that should be and can be avoided. Yeah, um, <clears throat> one of the there's an aspect to this question that's that's gently troubling, and it is that um, as as asked it. it it seems to be influenced a lot by the, the legacy of African-American communal struggle. And we need to understand that African-Americans as a people have had a long, long and much longer history of fighting from the streets for their rights and against brutalities and excesses on the part of the state, right? Much longer. We are new. There is. We have, if we look at ourselves, historically, the, the oldest community of Africans in Canada reside in Nova Scotia. The, other was, the, the, the others are the underground railroad uh, communities that came through uh, the Midwest, which would be Ontario, ended up in Windsor, those who ended up in Alberta, Saskatchewan, um, uh, I, I don't think Manitoba, and definitely BC, British Columbia. So if you look at our, the history of Africans in, in Canada, they were dispersed and they had to survive as best they could in the communities where they found themselves. African-Americans by dint of the full weight of white 
contempt, hate, dehumanization, and violence had to organize themselves or else they would just die. So they have this activist tradition that's an integral part of their communal life experience, which we do not yet have. And so the question is a legitimate question, but it's one that, is, that has to be accepted or has to be responded to in light of the conditions within which we as Africans find ourselves in this also large country where we're living in perhaps one of its wealthiest and largest, most populated parts, Southern Ontario. And we're yesteryear's people. We really, in large numbers, have only been here since just after the war in 1945, in large numbers, right? So all of that you see here is new. Now we're advanced somewhat by virtue of the technologies we have access to, such as this, which you're taking, taking advantage of. But we have to be careful when we say, when we say what is being said, the, the, the university aspect, societies have changed. Um, in many communities in Ontario and, and Toronto, if you go into those communities and you attempt to um, mobilize peoples, the African Canadian community is not a community like others. We are, the, I would say, one of the most intensively policed communities in Canada. When you go into certain spaces to say you're going to do community activism, you're doing such against the police. Okay, so there's no innocent room and room for innocence when it comes to us. So we, whatever you see that's being done is being done with those taken for granted factors that are not spoken of. Another question? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Francis Darko, question? <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, so I'm joining you from the United States. Um, so, um, a kind of interruption if it's okay. Um, so, I will appreciate the panelists for such an apt um, knowledge and then submission. And um, my question is, how can the Black Father mentor his own case? Um, living in the United States for some time now, I have had the opportunity to talk with a couple of Black guys and um, one thing they are pointing out is that I don't have a mentor, I don't have a mentor. And the question is, who do you want to be your mentor? And I think that um, anything that we will be in future, anything that we will be for whatever, where we, we will go, start from the home, which is the family. And so in the family, the father being the head, what kind of mentorship role can the father play in assisting the kids to become who they want to be? Thank you. So, so the, the, the point is that there are you know, there are fathers in the states who are not living with their families. So, just to re uh, and and Francis, uh, is it Francis? Sorry, I want to make sure. Yes, it's Francis Darko. Thank you. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. So, I took the question as um, there's a lot of there's I think there's a few questions or a couple of questions in there that I took into, into consideration. Um, one. Yeah, the youth are asked and mentioning that uh, they're looking for a mentor, don't know how to seek mentorship. Um, and the second part is, Francis, uh, please chime in again uh, if you need to, if I'm saying this incorrectly, uh, is that um, you know, how do black men play that mentorship role for, for their young? Did right. I say that correctly? Right, right, right. Two in one question over there. So in part, we come back to Charles's initial observation about the formal development of organizations, right? That we understand that these organizations are necessary and that's why they're developed. So the issue is for, I don't know what state province Francis is in or city, right? But in the United States, there is a culture of mentorship. Right? There's an active culture, culture of mentorship. And, and so the, the question is, how to access those resources. And again, coming back to Charles's point about it being online, that we now have this technology, that there are ways to reach out to those organizations that do provide those services. Yeah. And that might be the way for those uh, young men to have, to have access to their mentors. Hey, Francis? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, 
That's nice. So what role yeah. can the father, the black father, play as a mentor in the family? What part can the father play as a, as a mentor in the family? Let me see. Let me see. Uh, Francis. Hello. Yeah, I can I'm hear going, you. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you mm -hmm. to understand the particular historical and social context within which you find yourself. Okay? Mm -hmm. African American family in America today is a family that is on the siege. Mm -hmm. They are not able. I'm assuming you're speaking of African Americans as opposed to continental Africans living in America or Caribbean Africans living in America or all the diasporic Africans living in America. If you are, we need to understand African American people are on the siege for a number of reasons. And so when a young man says he's looking for a mentor. He genuinely is looking because those that he needs, if he wishes to live a, a life beyond that of a marginalized one mm -hmm. and all that which negatively goes along with that, he, he needs to move, he needs to make choices which might make him to himself be critical and dismissive of his own circumstances. Right. Because if he has the need for mentors, it means the mentors are not there, or if they are, they are inadequate to his own needs, and that he has a vision for his life that is beyond that which could be accommodated in the family context he finds himself. Okay. So those of us who are observing need to understand the incarceration rate, the um, probation rate, Mm -hmm. The surveillance that these men go through, mm -hmm. the, 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 unemployment. The, the unemployment, the casual labor, just the harshness of life on an everyday basis for African American men. We would, I would like to say, just working class, but I know this is the same for all classes of African men in America, regardless of the sector of the economy within which they find themselves occupationally, right? If yeah. you listen yeah, to I'm discussions here. online, when these men meet, when they talk, the doctors and the lawyers with the school teachers, the factory laborers and the porters in the hospital, they all say the same thing. Yes, I'm making money, but brother, when I leave this factory, I leave this office, I leave this hospital, I'm a black man. Mm. And that's a particular set of responsibilities that make fathering very, very difficult, and at the same time, very unique. And it's almost the case that if you're fathering, then that's the job that, that, that is being done. There's no right way, no wrong way. Once it is done, then it is doing what needs to be done. Okay. Because their lives are just so, so unique in America vis-a-vis -vis other classes and races so unique continentally vis-a-vis -vis Canada, so unique globally when compared to other nations in the world, right? That we really have to just give them praise for whatever they do, whatever they come up with, that is constructive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Any other questions before I go to the chat? So there's a question here, another another mentorship question from the chat here. Um, so can you elaborate? I think we, we, we did. Um, I'm just gonna ask a question just to make sure that you know we, we don't miss anyone here. Um, can you elaborate on mentorship, the mentorship aspect of, of fatherhood? I'm gonna preface that with black fathers, fatherhood with that too. So for me, um, as a father who is resident. The mentorship, first and foremost, is about me understanding myself. I think that if fathers do not understand themselves, they cannot effectively father, yeah. right? Because knowledge of self comes first. And the first step of freedom for me was to forgive my father, right? Was to understand and make sense of the context 
in which he was basically helping us to survive. Like Jamal said, he put food on the table, nurtured the best he could and so on and so forth, right? I needed to understand that. I needed to transcend what I regarded as my father's deficits as really his vulnerabilities. And now when I talk to my father, I have a different quality of conversation with him. And so I am now able, right, by virtue of having transcended that anger at my father, I'm not able to mentor my own son because I'm now not commanding my son into obedience, into disciplining his existence. Yeah. I'm now having conversations, negotiating, encouraging, and directing him toward a quality of understanding of his life and the context in which he's in because I have a better understanding of mine. So I think that when it comes to mentoring and fathering, I think it's six, six and one half dozen of the other. Right? There's not much difference, but it always to me comes back to every man beginning to understand who they are and where they come from. And only by that means are they able to relate to either their mentees or their own children uh, in ways that are less authoritarian, more encouraging, right? More disciplined. And I think that, that that's, that's where we can do effective mentoring and fathering by coming to terms with who we are and where we have come from. Can, can I, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a question, there's a question actually here, but um, this, this concept of discipline, the second time has come up, you know? Um, and I think this could be, if we can, um, in, in, you know, invoke this, this term into the conversation now, into discipline, I think this could be used in a way to um, mentor a lot of black men watching right now. Right, because you had mentioned uh, in the beginning of the, of the of the segment today, you know, discipline, being disciplined, right? Like, what are you talking about when it, when it comes to being disciplined? Now, now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be vulnerable, folks. Sorry, I feel like I close up, but I'm gonna be vulnerable, right? Now, see how I discipline you? <laughs> oh yeah, I get it from him. Don't get don't, don't get it twisted. Like I get it. You know, sometimes like it's a hard one. You know, but it's 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 made me. Be the man that I am now, be the scholar that I am now, emerging scholar that I am now. You know, Warren Sydney seat, get that dissertation done, you know, and I'm almost at the finish line because of him. There'd be no barbershop talk, regardless of when I started it, it wouldn't manifest the way it is if it wasn't for him. Because of those long talks, because of that the direction. So, like when I think of the word discipline. I'm not, I'm not thinking of like, oh, the harshest, well, yeah, it's harsh at times, but it's, I have to, I have to live with that, you know, I have to ground myself with that, and I have to respect that not only because I'm being told that, but for myself, so I'm going to stop there, because Charles, thank you, because you gave it to him, and I'm not receiving from, 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 from you to him to me, and you're getting it too, so you, This is the thing about the mentoring, yeah. right? Um, we used to have an organization back in the day called Each One Teach One. Yes. Right? Yes, yes. yes and yes, yes. that was literally the philosophy. So I remember I would call this man at 12 o'clock at night to go for a walk. I can't do that with him, but <laughs> right? No, no. Okay, right? <laughs> but, 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 okay, but the, 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 the point of a disciplined existence is when you reach the limit of your capacity, you reach out. That's discipline. Yeah. And you have to hope that when you reach out, the ones that you're reaching out to can deliver. Yeah? Because, you know, personal revelation time, I have been mentored and mentored from I was zero to now. Yes? So for a long period of time, I grew up without my father. Right? And when I did meet him, we did not get along. Right? And as I've gotten older, I am my father. <laughs> and my father is the kind of man that would make the devil blink twice. When he went to heaven, the devil phoned Jesus and asked Jesus for help. Take this one. And Jesus said, I'm busy right now. You know? Call tomorrow. Maybe. Right? He suffered no enemies whatsoever. He was perpetually ready for war. Okay? Now, I'm the complete opposite when I was young. I'm my mother's son when I was young. As I've gotten older, I am now my father's son. 
and I can see the war. We, we, we spoke towards the end of his life. We, my mother and sister and I went, we met and we rapped, yeah? And we got along. But I realized I could see the creep of his presence, his choices in my life, right? And his, it's a, it's a, the word is discipline, but this kind of ruthless, hard way of living. He lived on his own. If people didn't like him, he didn't care. If people didn't visit, he didn't care. I, I can't explain it to you, right? But that's me now. And that's because when I look at life, I can see if you come out of an ecosystem of options, yes, then you could see the different models that work. It's like when you're starting a business, banks will ask you to submit a business plan. And when you do the business plan, you're going to look at examples that you wish to follow, right? And if those examples are successful, that's exactly how you're going to run your business, right? Or the mentors you speak to, they have a plan that work that they're going to share with you, right? I saw my father's plan. I didn't approve of it when I was young because he was, woof, yes? When I got older, I looked back at my life. I said, gentle Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Because I saw a plan. And this is where now, when you come out into the world and you meet people and you share with people, you hope that if when you reach out, those who you hold your hand and give back, give back what you need on your terms as much as on their own, as much as on theirs, right? And the mentors that I had, I mean, one of them, Hector Bunyan, we spoke every single Saturday morning for almost 20 years. And we worked through every problem. I have a mind now that's so powerful, I can actually, I, remember I did this one time with Olegun. Mm -hmm. We were talking about, um, who was in power, um, the, the prime minister, the, the president um, in the, in the 2000, oh, oh, um, George Bush. And we were going for a walk. He was another mentor. Olegun and I are walking. And Olegun said, I can't understand why George Bush wants to launch a war against Saddam Hussein. And I said, listen, this is how it's going to go. George Bush and his men are sitting down and they're talking. This and this and this and this and this is said. This and this and this is going to be said, and these people are going to be opposed to it, right? Okay, fast forward. What's it, um, Stone, was it Roger Stone? Mm -hmm. That's Bush's um, no, no, the, the, the film, boy. the film, Oliver oh, Stone. Oliver, okay. Quickly. Oliver Stone made a movie about the meeting, that, the meetings that were held with Colin Powell and Donald Rumsfeld and all the boys for the war. And as I, whatever I said on that walk, Oliver Stone had it word for word in that film. What am I saying? I say, when you have the right mentors, they take you places that you need to go, that you do not even know in your time of need, you need to go. But if you trust them, right, they will help you get to that destination. They really will, right? And they will expand your range of options that you have to select from. I, I appreciate that. You know, my, my, my humor shot to Tamari in terms of he wouldn't pick up the phone. That was his humor there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you this, right? Like, when he calls, I answer that phone. Yeah. Like, it, it warned, we gotta talk. Hey, uh, uh, world, you gotta stop. That's how it is. You know what I mean? I, I, I won't even lie, I think it was like last month he called, I was so tired. And he called me and I was like, I can't, man, I'm, I'm, I'm so tired, but I still pick up the phone. Because Tamari, that's my mentor, you know what I mean? So I think mentorship is really, really important, but I appreciate what was said in terms of that connection. Because not everybody is for everyone, you know what I mean? And that's important because you can't just... And you may be led astray. You got to, as a mentee, you got to determine for yourself, is this person for me? Is this person have the best interest for me? Are they trying to lead me down astray? So it's really important. Um, but I don't, want, I don't want to dominate here So, because there's other questions that, that, that are spewing in here. Um, so we got, oh, we got an in-person question. So let's go, go to that. And then, uh, Carrie, I, I see your question. Uh, we'll get to you next. Um, I, I can't see the name. Who's that? Chris. Chris, are you there? 
Yes, I'm there, Warren. Thank you for a great discussion. And I look forward to reading your, your dissertation uh, when it uh, comes out. Oh, um, you're, putting, you're putting pressure on me, Chris, now. Oh, <laughs> right. Nice, nice, Chris, man. You just put more fuel on my face. You're going to call tomorrow night, Warren. You heard me, man. I'm not the only one. All right, Chris, go ahead. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and also, um, a gre greetings to, to, to everyone who's speaking. Uh, Professor Katasa, you did a book in 2019 published by uh, University of Toronto Press entitled African Canadian Leadership. I think you had some interesting things there to say about how black men are construed within the context of Black Lives Matter discourse. So it'd be interesting if you can kind of explicate your thoughts on, on how BLM construes and constructs uh, black men. Yeah, that, that, that's a tough one. And I think that, um, thanks for asking the, the, the question, Chris. Um, that, that, that's a tough one because uh, it gets to the issue of how a certain narrative of black men gets to be a commodity that, uh, as a friend of mine, uh, Chris Williams, called it uh, necroactivism, where uh, there isn't a sense of forgiveness and a capacity to negotiate with black men. There is a presumption that black men are a type and that type becomes the dominant narrative and so then black men literally become commodities uh, for a particular type of activism but when you look at the ways in which uh, BLM engages with black communities particularly in the United States they can't go to Ferguson they can't go to Cincinnati right um, I, just, I don't think they can go certain places here too. Well, okay, right. So, so what, I just want to add. Sorry. So uh, what I was writing about in that particular essay, I was riffing on the ways in which, for example, the Black Panther Party built relationships, mm -hmm. right? And it was a party that cultivated relationships. So I think BLM is not singular, is not uniform. There are different people that engage within it for different reasons, but there is a philanthropic capitalist dimension to some of the people that are quote unquote in the leadership position that part of what enables them to get over is literally representing a narrative of straight black men as the new white people of the black community. And I think those sorts of narratives get to be really dangerous contentious, conflictual, and I think we need to take a step back from that to build relationships with each other, right? And I think that's, Chris, that's where it's coming from in, in that paper, trying to make that argument, that we need to set up a new framework for dialogue and conversation rather than framing straight black men as the enemy. Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Katasa. Thank you. Uh, so next question is from Kerry. Goring, and she says, uh, loving this conversation. What advice, oh, thank you, by the way. Thanks for uh, participating, Carrie. I trust you're still there, Carrie, you still there? Shout out to Carrie, you're still there. If you're not, we're gonna ask your questions. Um, what advice or such comments, thoughts do you have for black women who are seeking to connect slash bit or hold space for black fathers? The very question itself. The very question itself seems to me to begin that space, to hold space. Um, and I think that it, it will follow from that. I mean, I, I don't want to be um, uh, so superficial about it, but from, from my vantage point, right, to follow from the, the BLM question, we need to have places and spaces, right, where Black men can actually speak their piece. Um, I'll just, a little story. I gave a presentation to a university in 2019 at a university, and I called this talk the uh, Black Empathy Deficit Disorder, right? That there's an empathy deficit disorder for black men. Literally, the black, young black men, the university students in that room, they oozed defeat, right? And there was a sense of defeat for these young men about them that 
I just, it, it really broke my heart because they were the evidence of the lack of empathy for black men that exactly that I was lecturing about. What concerned me in addition to that were the questions that I got from young black women. At least those young black women, it was like a celebration of their defeat, of these men's defeat. And I, I, I thought that we have a quite serious problem in the way that the narrative about gender and masculinity gets to construct a hegemonic narrative about straight black men that literally gives them no room to move, no maneuver. And I think we need to, as Kerry says, to hold space, literally to allow black men to speak. And if it's incorrect speech, allow them to speak and engage them in a conversation, in a dialogue that enables them to reflect on the nature of their speech because that might not be how they're living they're literally trying to find their way and we're not giving these young men the opportunity to find their way and i think carrie's question is important because it begins to open up space for that dialogue i 100 percent agree so i'll chime in really quick and you know uh, for those who are around, uh, online and a few people here obviously um that's what this segment is about is holding that space because when we talk about, you know, that speech or the speech you speak about, sorry, uh, it sometimes comes with vulnerability, right? And a sense of, you know, can I be vulnerable in this space? Can I share and not be looked on, uh, looked upon a certain way, right? Which at times, and you alluded to this uh, beautifully when you said it, you know, at times it's like, as a, as a young black man sitting there, you may have some thoughts you want to say, and it's like, I say it and you get the look, or someone has a comment. Or are they question in such a way where you feel like, man, should I even ask that question? So I think it's more than just saying, how to um, just um, you know bringing it up, but learning how to do it in a very reciprocal manner. That's that's a do no harm approach, uh, and one that liberates people, all people in the space to learn and listen. Actively. So that's what I wanted to add there. Any, anything else? Sure, if you want. Okay. All right. So um, we're nearing the end of the time. It happens real quick in the barbershop talk series, but um, before we, we let folks go, um, final thoughts, you know, thoughts you want maybe to share with the audience to take away and reflect, um, yeah, anything come to mind. I know there was a lot said, mind you, right? Um, but I think when you leave people with a gift of, of, of thoughts, you know, it can go a long way for some people. I really do. So, you know, I this thought that if you were a black man and you're a father in your other fathering your most effective means for doing so is to forgive yourself i think that we live with a tremendous amount of guilt because we've internalized the deficient the presumption of our deficiencies of our pathologies the presumption that we can do nothing right i think as men we need to be begin from an easier space of beginning to figure ourselves. Because I think that from the for the men that I know that I talk to, they're often the hardest on themselves uh, than anyone else. And I think it, it's literally killing us. Uh, our uh, uh, death rate uh, from 55 to 60 uh, as men, men generally in Canada, but for black men in particular, is beginning to creep up. So I think we need to begin to take a, take a step back and, and to begin to soften with ourselves. And I think that would open up space for others in our lives. Thank you. Charles? Well, <clears throat> I'll say this. Um, I saw a quote the other day online, a united, family eats, a united family eats from the same plate, which means if you share and you're in a family, not only are you, not, are you automatically united in some way, but you are a stronger family because of it. So if you share with the family, be it your own or the extended family of which you are a part, it's, it's gonna be good for you because you're, you're gonna help people. If you're able to do this within the context of what you define as your family, right? Your family is gonna be a lot stronger for it. Instead of sitting down and talking about dominoes, you talk about fathering and the absent father, it's gonna go far. Tamari and myself, we were part of a university culture where a lot of the people who attended university at York University in Toronto were at a stage in their lives where we needed the people that we, we were with. 
we needed each other. And our, our telephone conversation, I mean, some people, you would call them after nine at night in the middle of the week. And some phone lines were hot until two, 12, two o'clock in the morning because we were going to go to university full time. But we were talking and helping each other grow, right? There are cats that I, I spoke to, you meet them on the subway, at a bus stop, you know, a, a dance, at the airport. I mean, you start to talk and people stand and look like, oh, you went to university with, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that, oh yeah, that's, that's his thing, right? But it helped us grow. The other point is I'd like to leave the understanding, I'd like to leave uh, the audience with, is to understand when you do all this work as Tamari is suggesting, coming to terms with your inner demons, understanding how you were created and how much of what you have inherited in terms of behavioral options in your life are inadequate to meet the needs of mental peace here and now. When you come to terms with that, don't think the struggle is over. <laughs> you know, don't think the struggle is over. Because you're an African man, you are the source, source code of strength in this culture. Everyone is looking at you, and everyone wants to see how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, the music you listen to, the work choices you make, whether you stay on the job or leave, you are the unofficial leader of this country. Say I. Yes? Why? I read a book years ago. I didn't finish it, but I read it. Read what I read. By a gentleman named Robert Lacey. Lacey is spelled L-A-C-E-Y. It's called the House of Saud. And he was looking at Sa Saudi Arabia and the leaders, the, 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 the kings, the king's community, um, in the palace, the palace community. And he said, in this community and the society of Saudi Arabia, so much energy is imported by men into the control and regulation of the lives of women from their mothers to their daughters, that in point of fact, this supposedly Arabic Islamic male patriarchal culture is in fact a culture controlled by women because they invest so much effort into making sure the women don't walk alone, they cover their faces, they don't talk on the phone, and they're regular. If you're going to invest that much of your life into a, another human being, you're giving up your power and your agency to that person. African people are in Canada and the US not wanting to control other people's lives. We just want to be free to live our own, on our own terms, but we get interference. But why is, what does that mean for those who interfere? It means that they're giving us the power. Now, what it means when you come to terms with all of that, living becomes difficult in a different way because you now have to deal with people who will feel that you are arrogant, that you think you're superior to them, that you think you're better than them, <laughs> that you are beyond control, that you have to know your place, and all of this happens because you are the chosen scapegoat or one of them for this culture. And a lot of institutional energy is invested in keeping you in your place. When you decide, or you might not even decide, but you will not realize that when you go through all of these changes, you are a point of fact telling the society you're going to live beyond its code of negative expectations of your character. That's going to put it in another mode. And that's not going to be healthy. I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Samari. So we are at the end. I know people are like, "What's where's going on beer kit?" So Slanya can help us that beer kit. Can we do a raffle quickly? So was your name, Brady. Brady. Yeah. Uh, can we put Brady in that in that raffle real quick? Put name Brady in there because you can you can win a beer kit. You got a beer. So <laughs> <laughs> Put Brady in there right quick. You know, he, he got a haircut, so we got, you know, there's opportunity for him right now to win that beard kit. We got two of them. We got two of them. You got no hair. I love it. Got, 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 got. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Spin O wheel. Now, this this wheel, what's the, that's all. Oh, oh, okay. Congrats. Who's that? Who's that? What's that name? Sorry, what's this? 
Oops, I, I can't see that. Leon, are you there? Leon, are you there? You ain't there, you don't get it. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Leon, are you there? Spin one more time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how, that's how you get people to stay, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? TJ? Yes. Is that TJ? Yes. TJ, are you there? No. Are these people that signed in today? Are Kofi? Kofi? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, Kofi's there! <laughs> Congratulations, my friend. You got a beard kit coming your way. Ethos beard kit. So please sign it, get, get, grab Kofi's information and send it and let, and an email address and you know that stuff. Get in touch with Sonia. Sonia, please get um, Kofi's information. Let's do it one more I'll time. Put, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. One more, one more. And we have a quick comment from Winnipeg. He wants to close his out. So, that cool? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's that? <laughs> Bull. Is Bull. that Bull? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Bull, you got a beer kit coming your way, bro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there you are. Those are the two beer kits. Sorry for everybody else. You didn't get nothing, but next time. That's what I, that's what, uh, how I entice you to come back the next time. So, we got a last comment from Winnipeg, and then we're going to close this out. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't mean to keep everybody longer, but um, I just want to say that the discussion were uh, were really prank. Oh, like they're frank. They're really good. They're very open discussion. Uh, the group of people that we have here, they're very diverse in different age, but mostly are most of them are, are youth. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, most of them are youth, and it is very important that they they were able to attend to this discussion. Um, Majority of the time they did pay a lot of attention and I'm sure and I hope that they retained the information that we're, that we're talking about. And I do believe that as a, I'm from South Sudan, Abraham is from South Sudan and a lot of us, we're all from, uh, from different part of, uh, of Africa. And I think it's very important to have those discussions, especially when you're in the Western world, such as Canada. And a lot of youth, they, um, they, uh, they don't get those opportunities to have those discussions. They might think it's boring, but I do believe that it's important for a different part of, uh, of a black adult to have those open discussions because a lot of them, they're preparing to, to start their life, you know, as a teenagers and be able to go to university and colleges. So they, they will always want to look up to people um, who are a lot older than them that are actually doing the right thing. So it is very important that those things need to be pointed out and those conversations need to be half. And we, we are very appreciative of it. Um, this was actually a very, very, um, very good program that, 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 that you're hosting. And we're really very appreciative of it. And from Ruth Salon, we really appreciate everything. Everybody that was here from teen to adult. It's, it's great. It's great to have open conversation and just try to be mature about certain things that sometimes go under the rug. Um, or under the carpet. So yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, that's that's all I had to say. So thank you. Thank Thanks you very well. much. Much appreciated. Ephraim, do you want to make comment on go to the comment for Saturday Night Barbershop? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thank you guys for coming out. Uh, Warren, I know we met out of the blue in Ottawa, but this we come a long way. Networking goes a long way. Uh, for everyone that's attended in the shop and online, I want to thank you guys uh, for hosting it at Saturday Night Barbershop. Dr. Tamari, Dr. Charles, thank you for coming out. We've learned a lot from your conversations. We're looking forward to actually purchasing your book in the near future. We should never be too happy about the people. But yes, I uh, just wanted to know, I just wanted to let everyone know, like I hope everyone learned something from today. Uh, you know, networking does go a long way and you know, you guys, Definitely left us with some knowledge today. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, so again, thank you very much, folks at home. One well, more. this right? one, one, oh, one, we're going one more thing. One, one. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I, I wrote a list of sources 
um, uh, social media sources that I wanted the audience to be aware of. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time. There's three of them I'd like for you to consult uh, in, in, just in terms of um, information of relevance to our lives. I'm not asking you to follow. I'm asking you to add to your information sources, right? Um, there's a program called the Karen Hunter Show. Karen Hunter Show, she comes on. She's out of New York City. She's on Sirius. Brings in a lot of guests that talk about the issues of relevance to, to us. Um, uh, she, and then there is um, Roland Martin, who used to come and see on CNN many years ago. He has his own show, Roland Martin. And then there is um, uh, a website that I check out called Black Power Media. Black Power Media. And they are like an ecosystem of different programs of relevance to people of African heritage in the Americas, center to left progressive um, information sources. So, you know, you could look at it in the barbershop uh, when Karen comes on certain times of the day. Also too, for international news on Africa, um, China Global Television, now CGTN, every day roughly at around 12 or one o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time, they do an excellent program on news all across Africa, from north to south, east and west. And um, China Global, and France, France 24, France 24, they have an excellent program on Africa every day, Monday to Sunday, um, for one hour uh, in the evening, I think roughly around 10 o'clock at night, every night. So just to give you, give you the flavor. And they also do diasporic news, so you get you know, you'll see, what's the guy, the, the famous Jamaican rapper? Uh, how many of them? You know, uh, yeah, Sean Paul. E easy E. But I mean, Ika Mouse, Ika Mouse. Ika Mouse and all these guys, they, because he's very popular in France. Would you believe? Um, so all these guys are available. They cover film, theater, music, etc. So I just wanted to share that with you. My list was longer, but my computer broke down today, so I wasn't able to forward it. But, um, I don't know. We'll once see what we, we can work yeah, out. Once, once we get, once you get the senator, we'll yeah. publish it. And, okay. and Black News tonight with Mark Lamont Hill, Dr. Mark. Yes, Lamont yes, Hill. yes. That's yes, excellent yes, show. Yes. They're talking about critical race theory yeah. and how they are um, abolishing it in uh, in Texas, yeah. in the states there. Yeah. So check that out. Anyways, uh, can't go any further because people are going to charge me. Um, <laughs> so go home. <laughs> Done. Leave the barber shop now. Oh my wallets are gonna get thin. No, I'm joking. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> Have a good night. That's it. Bye bye. Thank you. Well done, man. All right, well thank you. Well done to everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Back.